Hello everyone, my name is Liliana Mohamed. I'm an intern at the Asbari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship. Today we have with us Dr. Shivani Satija, who is a feminist researcher and an editor at the Gender and Development Journal. Dr. Shivani has 12 years of expertise in the fields of gender, development, advocacy, and research. And in today's interview, we are going to discuss the new issue of the Gender and Development Journal, which is titled, A Gender Responsive Recovery ensuring women's decent work and transforming care provision. It was published on August 31, 2022, and it offers policy insights towards a gender responsive recovery for the gendered implications of COVID-19. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and providing me the opportunity to talk about the journal. Uh, yeah, I, I look forward to discussing uh, the issue at large and the journal specifically. So, uh, Dr. Shivani, would you begin by telling us what was the reason or the main motivation behind creating this issue? Yes, absolutely. So uh, the theme uh, uh, titled a gender responsive recovery, ensuring women's decent work and transforming care provision was collectively decided by the consortium of Oxfam six southern affiliates that took over the hosting of the journal from Oxfam Great Britain at the end of 2021 and early 2022. The consortium includes Oxfam's Brazil, Colombia, Kedip, Turkey, Mexico, India and South Africa. Now, this transition of the journal coincided with the peak of the devastating pandemic that revealed the enormous role of care workers, both paid and unpaid, along with the massive gaps in care infrastructure and policies across countries. Even before the pandemic, globally women performed over 70% of total hours of unpaid care work, more than three times as much as men. In Asia and the Pacific, this rises to 80%, according to the ILO 2018 report titled Care Work and Care Jobs for the Future of Decent Work. Yet, care work remains undervalued and underpaid. Given the undeniable central role of care work and care workers during the pandemic, anyone would assume that the world would finally recognize the value of care as work. Yet, there was no proper recognition of care as work nor appropriate financial remuneration, nor decent working conditions for care workers. Furthermore, the continued lack of state support in the form of investment in health and care services across countries was too stark to ignore. It was thus felt that the journal's first issue from the Global South should focus on the theme of care work and gender responsive policies. This double issue has been collectively edited and shaped by a team of reputed feminist scholars and activists, namely Fatima Kelleher, Jayati Ghosh, and Valerie Esquivel, and draws from a wide range of countries, or draws from a wide range of case studies across countries from the global south. Thank you so much for your response. Of course, I, it's definitely very essential to talk about this uh, topic, to write about it, to share as much knowledge and information as possible in order to also raise awareness. So with that being said, what would you say is the role of civil society groups and non-governmental organizations in raising awareness on this matter? Right. Um... So the significant role of women-led groups, collective organizations, and long-standing community-based interventions is well-documented. These collective efforts not only help in increasing women's participation in the paid economy and in demanding decent work and decent conditions for care workers, but also in pressing for recognition and redistribution of care as essential work. There are numerous examples that this double issue uh, highlights in which collectives and civil society organizations help provide food relief, livelihoods, community-based care services, emotional support, and vital information to marginalized groups during the pandemic. This was possible, of course, because of these groups' long-standing work and commitment in communities and the trust that they had built over decades through their work. The contributions in this issue highlight the enormous potential of community-based care arrangements, labor organizations and unions, and women-led cooperatives and campaigns in making care infrastructure more resilient, as well as in demanding the respect and, re and re re remuneration that care work deserves. 
Okay, so now since we've kind of touched upon how important it is for civil society groups to engage in this topic and for like, since we've seen the role of NGOs, what would you say is the role of states in all of this? Or how does the absence or the lack of adequate state provisions, uh, policies, the recovery plans, or even an agenda for recovery, how does it impact or add on the existing burden on the care workers and informal workers? Um, so across the world, public spending patterns are increasingly moving away from investing in public care service provision, which have had serious implications on the lives of marginalized groups. This trend continued during the pandemic, and the devastating effects of economic austerity came into sharp relief with le high levels of mortality and morbidity across the globe. This lack of political will and financial investment in care and health services by governments across countries placed enormous pressure on women, particularly women belonging to marginalized socioeconomic groups, such as Black women, Indigenous women, Dalit women, migrant women, who were forced to bear the disproportionate burden of providing care, both paid and unpaid. Many of these women were involved in informal work and were left out of crisis response measures initiated by governments, measures which failed to account for intersecting vulnerabilities accruing from gender, race, class, caste, and ability. Many informal women, uh, women workers, lost their jobs or had to withdraw from the paid workforce due to mounting care obligations at homes with the closure of schools and childcare facilities. These women found it harder to return to paid work, again due to the care burden at home and other socioeconomic and cultural factors. Overall, the inability or unwillingness of the state to step up and take care of its marginalized citizens during a devastating pandemic forced individual men as well as women-led collectives to take on this responsibility of providing care and continue working often beyond their bodily capacity with little remuneration and hardly any recognition. This current issue captures and highlights some of these experiences and voices. Okay, so since um, we're still like we're speaking of policies and the role of state policies and in, in all of this, why do you think is it essential to have a more structural gendered analysis of the policies that already exist? So as we all know, the structure of care work is gendered. Care work is often characterized by exploitation and lack of adequate recognition and re remuneration. Thus, the mere existence of policies such as social protection and labor protection will not necessarily guarantee the rights of marginalized groups involved in precarious care work, precarious care work such as sanitation work and intimate care work. Given that women are overwhelmingly represented in lower and lesser paid rungs of paid care work and community work, their intersectional needs need to be addressed urgently. These policies does need to be embedded within the political and economic realities and the social cultural norms that shape perceptions around care work. The process of policy making also needs to incorporate the voices of informal women workers, care workers, and other marginalized labor groups in order to be more gender and care sensitive. Multiple studies in this special issue conducted a gendered analysis of state policies across many countries before and during the pandemic to assess if they are care and gender sensitive or not. They also offer tools that help care advocates and policymakers to assess policies and shape them towards being more care and gender sensitive. Overall, authors in this issue propose that policies to address women's care work cannot be simply top down but need to emerge from within the informal women workers collectives and movements. Moreover, these policies need to be not only gender responsive, but also gender transformative, that question, mm -hmm. challenge, and address deeply entrenched, inequitable gender norms. Okay, uh, so now since we've covered uh, the role of states, of uh, civil society groups, of NGOs, what would you say is the role of feminist groups in this? Like, how can feminist activists engage with legal and policy discourse to make them more gender and care sensitive? Um, so like I mentioned above, the mere existence of labor protection laws and policies are not enough, as these often do not address layers of marginality like 
caste or migration status, for instance, or the lack of legal awareness or financial ability of most vulnerable groups to actually approach the legal systems and utilize redressal mechanisms. There is thus a need for women-led initiatives and groups and feminist activists to engage with the legal and policy discourse of care and care work. One way that feminist and legal activists are shaping the legal and policy landscape is by addressing the gendered language that is constructed around care. Some contributions in this issue bring out the gendered norms and expectations that undergird paid care work. And this is reflected in the use of terms like honorarium rather than the word salary received by the so-called voluntary and scheme workers in India and other countries. Other gender discriminatory words associated with care are duty and service. Language is thus one of the ways to address the lack of recognition, remuneration, and respect around care and care work. And thus more gender sensitive terms need to enter the legal and policy vocabulary. While there are significant strides that have been made in recognizing paid care work as work, unpaid care work within the family is still not recognized as work. And often it is very difficult to unionize if one does not have a clear labor work status. Mm -hmm. And so these are the challenges that are there in this, in this process. Overall, connecting care work with political work is a transformative step and needs to make its way into legal and policy discussions through feminist legal and activist work. And that is some of the, uh, we try to bring that out to some of the examples in this double issue. Thank you so much for all the insight and for the, all the information that you offered us today. Uh, it was really an honor interviewing you and an even bigger honor to read the blog. It was very informative. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much.